Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Burkell with Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses to, for film professionals to deepen and diversify their existing skill set. Every week we go live Friday at 2 p.m. with a film professional to chat and give you a chance to join us and ask questions. Today I'm being joined by Stefan Nakamura, the colors for Fight Club, Kill Bill 1 and 2, It, and more recently, Defy Bloods, among many others. Uh, hi, Steve, uh, Stefan. Thanks for coming on the show. Sure, glad to be here. Thank you. So I, as you heard, I've, I've listed off a lot of, uh, of films here, but one of the things I've noticed is uh, there, in a couple of situations, you've actually got directors that you have like long time worked with them. So, you know, David Fincher, Ridley Scott. Um, and I don't hear that as much with colorists. And I'm wondering how do you went about, like how did this relationship evolved? Um, how do you go about developing relationships like that so that they last uh, long-term? Well, I think, um, you know, the real key for colorist um, is you really need to get in tune with the director's sensibility, right? So it's kind of like most people go back to the same person that cuts their hair, right? Because you're kind of like, I don't have to tell this person how to cut hair. This person just kind of knows what I like. So it's, it's really your ability um, when we're on this side of the production and post-production to really say, hey, I'm going to try to get in tune with this director and what their sensibilities are. And once you can connect that way, then there's a real shorthand for communication, which makes it really simple for them, you know, because they're typically during the finishing process, they're doing the mix, they're doing audio, they're finalizing visual effects. Um, so they're working on a, in a whole bunch of different areas. And so... Um, you know, I think the last thing they really want is to just be doing more minutiae stuff with color. So if they have a shorthand with their colorist and they kind of trust that their colorist can kind of paint pictures for them at the way that they find pleasing uh, um, for a particular movie that they're doing, then they'll come back, you know, especially if you make their lives easy for them also. Now, there's so many people involved in the look of the film. You know, there's the cinematographer, but there's also set decorators. There's also costume uh, departments. How do you work with all the various people, but particularly the cinematographer and director to get a particular look for a film? Um, you know, usually you, you have a conversation with a director cinematographer beforehand. Um, and so that you get an idea of what they think the movie should be and what it should look like. Um, a lot of times you also get to see the dailies cut together from the Avid. So if there were, if there was a colorist on set that was setting looks, you can already get a glimpse of the kind of feel that they want for their movie. So that makes it a lot easier, you know, just having sort of like the Avid output of the show. If the cinematographer had time dailies, whether it's with a colorist or a DIT, um, it gives you a really good base for where you can start. And then it's basically having some conversations. You know, some directors have, um, um, you know, a certain preference and style for them. They look at color certain ways. So once you understand how they operate um, and the kind of looks that they like, then it's very easy for you to, you know, implement those looks on a different, different kind of show or movie that they're doing. Even if they're doing a lot of horror, then they do a drama, then they do some other type of movie. But if you know their sensibilities, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an easy shorthand that way. Now, we do have a question here from uh, Tony Lawrence, and he wants to know, are you guys in the process of giving a new uh, native 4K remaster to 2006's Dream Girls from Paramount uh, for Blu-ray or UHD? I am unaware of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am too. So <laughs> yeah. now... As I mentioned, you, you've been working with people like uh, Fincher and Ridley for a while. Um, one of the things I noticed is you started back before we had things like Resolve and what have you. So from the old sort of telecine days, mm -hmm. what have you learned from working in that format or that, I guess, approach to color that you use still to this day? Um, you know, in the... Back when we we're doing telecine, obviously it was a, a film to tape transfer. So if you're doing features, it's was film to film. So they would go to the lab and have a lab timer time their film. 
um, they would have printer points, you know, and they would have a point of red, a point of green, they can make it a little bit brighter, a little bit darker. Um, they didn't really have the control uh, that we had digitally when we we're doing film to video. So mm -hmm. all the commercials, the music videos, TV shows and stuff like that, um, that we would all be coloring. We have power windows, we can do color isolation. Um, you know, we can do all those things that were not available in the feature film realm. Then when the DI came about in the like early 2000s, um, the technology had gotten to a point where the color correctors could take on these large files that were, you know, 2K, 4K files, and um, you could color correct it uh, for theatrical. And then that was like a big game changer for a lot of directors, like David Fincher, for example. You know, he, that was the first really big DI that Technicolor had when they started in 2002. Um, so I was working with David and he said, hey, I want to do Panic Room in this DI thing. <laughs> and, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty big move, even though it didn't seem like it was a big move. It was a really huge move at the time because basically the technology was in its infancy. So at that point, no one was really quite sure if this thing could really work as well as the idea was that it could work, right? Because there's so many pieces of the puzzle in order to get a DI to finally, you know, um, have a graded file that you could print on film. There's so many factors involved um, to get that to look right. And at the time we're just kind of inventing the wheel. So it was a really huge move because I'd basically giving up all my telecine clients and commercials and, video and stuff like that to move into the feature realm. Um, and it was pretty, it was a pretty arduous process that, uh, you know, we lost a lot of our lives, I think, <laughs> from the hours and the, you know, the pain back in the day as equipment wasn't working. And, you know, I mean, you're just trying new technology at the time. So, uh, but, you know, it, it, it all worked out. And um, so now, you know, like doing a DI is just no different than doing a commercial or yeah. music video or anything else now it's very similar well and this in, it's interesting that you would say that because this industry is very demanding um so for example like you're talking about learning the di process how do you keep up on all this like, advancement because it's constantly advancing and how do you make sure that you're going down the right path because there might be competing versions of the di there might be competing software you know what's your approach for that well, I mean, the good part about being at Company 3 and being at a you know, large coloring facility like this is that we have clients in all forms of media, you know, for, like again, commercials, videos, TV, features, um, anything you can imagine, we have clients that need color for. So as a result, the technology gets pushed from our clients is because the clients will say, hey, I want to do this. I want to do 4K, I want to do, I need HDR streaming, I need this, I need that, you know, and it forces us to step up our game and figure it out for them. I mean, that's what we do. Um, you know, the difference between us at, Co at Company 3 um, from, you know, me working from my house is, is literally just the technology that's involved. I mean, you know, in order to get things done properly um, on a large scale, um, for example, you know, you do a, a, a huge hundred million dollar plus movie. I mean, there are so many parts that people are not aware of that needs to come together in order to get that movie to fall into place so that we can meet the deadline of that movie getting released on time and everything looking right from multiple, you know, dozen vendors sending us stuff. Um, things coming in on the last minute. I mean, we have had to have an army of people just to get things done. Um, so, uh, you know, just from the technology and our clients having needs that we need to push ourselves, uh, to the limits of our capabilities and past, um, you know, that keeps us on our toes. Now I have a question here from Martin Lopez and he wants to know when you're working with directors like, um, uh, Ridley Scott or Fincher or whoever, how much freedom do you have as a colorist? I have a tremendous amount of freedom because they, uh, 
you know, when you build a relationship with a director, again, I think most of the colorists will tell you the same thing. If they have a relationship with a director, I mean, it's, they really trust you. And as a result, they don't need to be there when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And even when they come in and supervise, they're not changing that much. I think if you ask most colors, they'll tell you the same thing. You know, so when I have a shorthand with directors that I work with all the time, the, my goal is so that the, the last thing they need to worry about in the finishing process is the color. You know, I want them to just be like, I need to go work on these other things. And if I got to get into the weeds with somebody on a particular aspect of my film, I can get into the weeds, but I don't want to worry about the color because I know that's going to be taken care of. I mean, that's the kind of relationship you want to have, right? Like you don't want, they're not going to want, no one wants a relationship where, you know, let's say you're building a house and you have to supervise every single person Yeah. and getting into the weeds of like your painter and the person that's going to do your flooring and the person that's doing your roofing. I mean, you know, it's just drive you crazy. So if I can just alleviate that aspect of their lives so that they can just come in and go, oh man, I think looks great, but let's just change this and that. And, you know, hopefully it won't take that long, then, you know, it's, it's, it's just a lot better for everyone. Yeah. It's like becoming their left arm so that they don't have yeah. to think about it. Absolutely. Uh, Kareem wants to know, how do you decide between ACES, Baselight, T-Log, E-Gamut, or Resolve Color Management for your projects? Um, I think, again, that's, uh, it's very client dependent. Mm -hmm. So some studios have different requirements when we're doing, you know, we're talking in the feature world. Um, some studios have different requirements. We basically take a look at each project, right? So each project is done on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I, I would say for the, bulk, for the bulk of movies, we can kind of push them into a certain pipeline. Some other movies you basically have to break the mold um, because of certain needs that they may have. So as a result, um, it's a conversation we'll have with the clients in the studio. If they say they want to do ACES, we'll say, okay, we can do ACES. Mm -hmm. Well, what camera are you shooting for ACES? What kind of look do you want in ACES? And then we can kind of shape the project around ACES, you know, having ACES involved. Other times it's like, do you really need to deal with ACES? Maybe you don't. Do you really need this? You know? And so part of, part of what we do is we can handhold the clients throughout the whole process from the beginning to the end. The biggest problems that we've had um, as a finishing calling facility is when we don't have that conversation early on with her, with the clients, right? So if they start using a lookup table on set that is not appropriate to the finishing end, mm -hmm. the myriad of problems that will open up by the time you're at the finishing end is something that is... <laughs> Very crazy. Indoors box. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, so it's, th there's so many things that, that most people don't even think about, but it's really, really, really important. So, um, you know, it's really important to know the technology and to also talk to the clients about like, what are your needs and let us help you get your project to the finish line in the easiest way possible, in the shortest distance possible you know let's just go in a straight line instead of zigzagging back and forth by doing things unnecessarily now i have a question here from uh kim young and he wants to know uh can you share some advice for young colors what would you uh, tell a young colorist just getting started um young colorist you know i would say uh you just make sure that you keep coloring as many things as you can Right, because uh, I always tell people it's kind of like painting. You know, if you if you take a painting class and you learn how to paint a bowl of fruit and you think you did a great job and you keep painting for 10 years and then you paint that same bowl of fruit, you're gonna paint it completely differently. And you're gonna look back at what you did 10 years earlier and say, oh man, I didn't, I kind of didn't know what I was doing back then. Well, it's the same thing, right? The repetition and just coloring more and more and more footage. Um, you know, keeping an open mind, right? So having your mind be open constantly, even if you're coloring. So even for, for me, I mean, I've been coloring a really long time, but it's like, I'll look at a certain movie and say, oh, I think it should have this look because I've had that look a whole bunch of times, but it's really 
keeping my mind open and not being attached to anything, right? Because maybe we can try something else. Maybe we can try this and maybe it doesn't work, but maybe it does work, right? And there's so many different tool, tools that are in Resolve and these color correctors and you can try different things um, um, to create different looks. So it's really kind of being agnostic about things, right? Just keep your mind open. And it's, and it's like, every time you think you kind of know it all, you just think to yourself, you really don't know anything. If you just say you don't know anything, and then you look at other people's work, or you look at you know anything, photographs, and other, other people's work on TV or features, or you, know, you can always get great ideas, and you can try to replicate it. And, um, you know, it'll just give you more of a tool set to work with when you have a client that wants to have a certain kind of look. You can say, hey, you can come out of your bag of tricks in your mind to come up with something. Now, I, when I was researching for this talk, um, there was an article about you and uh, Pink Donowitz at Company 3 working together in regards to mentorship within the company and artist recruitment. How do you see, uh, how do you approach mentorship with young colors in your company then? Um, you know, we, most of our colors here um, have started off as assistants with us before. Mm -hmm. So um, they kind of, already know they have a good background about how we set up projects within the facility. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they have to learn the result because they're setting our projects up or sending our projectors up for us. So it's kind of like getting that base down. And then from there, they start coloring. And then a mentorship really is not just on color, but it's really about how to talk to people you know, how to handle a room. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's, it's part of the um, job that maybe a lot of people don't talk about, but it's super, super, super critical, which is you have to realize that we're the last part of the chain, right? So we start off in production and then we're in post-production, but not only are we in post-production, we're the last people that are gonna handle those images. We're like the very last people that are gonna handle the images before they make the DCP. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you have potentially a lot of people that are very nervous, right? You have people been working on this for years. You get the director that's nervous, you get the DP that's nervous, you got a visual effects that's nervous that all the visual effects are gonna look right, right? You've got the producers that are nervous, you've got the studio that's nervous, you got everybody. And sometimes people will have different ideas about what the movie should look like. And so, you know, part of your job as a colorist really is to just kind of make the movie look as best as it can and have everybody kind of not panic and, um, you know, keep everybody calm and do all those kind of things, which are, which is like a really big skill to have mm -hmm. in our business. So, uh, you know, part of our mentorship is not just with color, but it's really about, you know, sort of like how, how you handle people and how you talk to people, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very important part of our job. Now, uh, Mark wants to know, you know, with the whole COVID thing that's happened, uh, grading remotely with clients, how do you ensure that what they're watching is accurate uh, or is an accurate representation of what you're doing? Well, what we have is um, uh, we have two ways that we allow our clients to see things on their iPad. So, Basically, our clients have iPads or they're equipped with iPads and we have it, we have them calibrated the way um, we, we need it so that the color is accurate from what we're doing. So, for example, if we're doing um, commercial music video, TV, things that are graded on a monitor, like let's say an X300 that we grade on, um, we can have a setting on someone's iPad and we can stream it to them. So so that they're seeing the same thing. And, and it's also streaming to an iPad in my room. So I can see exactly what they're seeing. So, um, you know, if I'm seeing exactly what they're seeing and they're seeing our picture, then we have a good communication that way about, you know, grading things. It's worked really, really well. It's funny that you would say that because I talked to James Neist uh, for The Haunting of Bly Manor. And he had just finished doing that for Bly Manor with the iPad. And he said he's never been more nervous because he didn't know 
with the iPad work and it was coming out the next day. So he was very stressed. So I'm, I'm sure he's very happy with the, the results then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the really interesting thing about COVID is it's kind of sped up these type of things that was going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, this sort of, uh, because so many of our clients are in other countries, they're in other States by the time we're finishing, you know, it, it, it just was, it was going to get to this point anywhere where it's like, we got to be able to let them see on some device in their home somewhere when they're really busy, that they can take a look at the color. And so, you know, um, I did this short project with uh, uh, Nancy Myers recently, and she was literally on her iPad in her car signing off. She wasn't driving. <laughs> <laughs> she lost, she lost her internet at her yeah. house. So she drove to her daughter's house and was in her daughter's garage. So she has an iPad in her daughter's garage. Wow. And, and, you know, we're signing off on this movie, right? This short movie that she did. I mean, it's just, it's like fantastic, you know? Yeah. Uh, now, Jeff wants to know, do you work with color scientists a lot uh, or work on LUTs yourself? For sure. We work with color. We have a, a color science team. They are completely integral to our whole workflow. We could not survive without them. How does that relationship work? Oh, basically, um, let's just, let's just I'll, I'll give you like a really quick answer for that and then it'll get more complicated. But <laughs> let's just say how many different professional cameras are out there, right? So let's just say you got, you got a Red, you have Alexa, you have the Sony Venice, you have, well, you know, let's say five, six different cameras. You decide you want to shoot with a particular camera, right? So a client comes to you and says, hey, I shot Sony Venice or a next client says, I've shot with the red. I shot with this camera. I shot with that camera. Well, all those cameras are a little bit different. And basically what the color science team, what they do is they can basically provide a lookup table for us. That's basically going to maximize the look of that chip, right? So that we know when the footage comes in, we don't have any information there that we've left on the table. Everything is there that, 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 that what they shot, right? And then from there, if we want a certain look, we can make a certain look. But in a simplest form, from having different LUTs per camera and then having those LUTs translate from HDR to P3, to Rec. 709, you know, to Dolby Vision Theatrical, to, you know, all the different types of exhibition mediums which have different color spaces. They have different luminance levels, right? They're in different environments. You know, to be able to have lookup tables that are transition your project from one to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other quickly um, is why color science is, is completely invaluable. I mean, without them, we would just be like struggling. You know, it, I mean, it's like, think of it this way. Lookup tables are like a mold, right? So you bake in a cookie, you have a very intricate mold of something that has, you know, a whole bunch of lines and a face and eyes and nose and I have, you know, hair and everything else. I mean, if you just put the mold on, you're done. Mm -hmm. If you just were trying to do that by hand, right, with a piece of dough, I mean, it's going to take you forever and it's not going to be as good. So um, you, if you look at it that way and you say, I have all these different exhibition mediums and I need a mold, if I do a mold for one and I need that mold to look right in another medium, that's what color science does for us. Hmm. Now, uh, Jaleel wants to know, uh, where do you go for inspiration when you're trying to build your looks? I mean, I don't really know. I don't really know <laughs> as far, you know, like I'm really agnostic when it comes to projects, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll get a project come in, like, you know, look, right now I'm working I'm juggling around like five movies right now. They're yeah. all completely different, right? One of them's a musical, another one's a drama, another one's horror, another one's action, right? You know, so uh, basically, well, I always take my cues from the cinematographer. The cinematographer has painted that picture that I'm getting. Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately what the cue is. Right, like you can already get a feel for what the movie is by the way the cinematographer has lit the scene. So you could yeah. get in, you could look at a movie even when it's raw, and you and you can see the arc of the movie. You can see 
what it should be like. So all the movies that I've graded, like I almost never listen to any audio, mm -hmm. but from the cinematographer's lighting and the actor's performances, I should be able to decipher what that thing should feel like. And then at that point, I'm just going to color to what I think the thing should feel like. Yeah. Right? And, and then I can go back to the dailies and just say, Oh, look, there were, I think I'm on the right track. Right. So I can always kind of pop back to the dailies and go, I'm on the right track. But my idea of this is, is a little bit colored different. Like let's say mm -hmm. I'm doing something cold and a dailies look warm. I'll say, Hmm, well, maybe that's a conversation to be had. So then at that point they'll come in as, and I'll say, Oh, look, you know, I thought this scene would look really cool being cool. And then they'll say, Oh yeah, that looks a lot better being cool. You know, stuff like yeah. that. So I don't, I mean, I guess, you know, you do it long enough, you just kind of go by feel. I mean, it really is very like an instinctual process. Do you, yeah. cause like I've, you know, I've worked on projects as an editor and I've had directors come in and be like, oh, I, you know, I based the scene off of this artist's work or this painter's work or this photographer's work. Yep. Do you, do you yourself go out to museums and check out uh, exhibits and what have you to keep up on sort of approaches in, in terms of lighting and what have you? Uh, I have, but, you know, again, in general, I mean, when people say they want a certain look for a movie, you know, for their movie, kind of like what they're referencing another movie, a lot of times that's completely impossible <laughs> because, because the way it was shot is completely different, right? Yeah. So, you know, we can, we can alter and help enhance whatever was shot, but that should never be taken for granted. You know, the cinematographer's role as time has gone on, I, I mean, I really feel like has been taken for granted, right? Compared to the, the old days before the DI. But I mean, it's really not the case. You know, the, the best looking movies mm -hmm. that everyone will say, and that thing looks really great, you know, uh, you know, you did such a great job as a colorist, kind of, but it's really shot that way. Yeah. Right. There's nothing we can do that's going to look like the most amazingly shot movie if it's not already amazingly shot. We cannot make something that wasn't shot well look like, you know, an Academy Award winning cinema cinematography, <laughs> you know, yeah. movie. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Right. So we can enhance and make things better, but we still can't do you know, we can't make something that's not there. So if you, if someone says, Hey, I want this look of this movie that you did, I want the look of that movie. I mean, I can look at the cinematography and be like, well, you can get 50% there, but it's never going to quite look at it because mm -hmm. they didn't shoot it that way. Right. Yeah. And it's gotta be shot. It's gotta be shot a certain way to make it look a certain way. Now, Alexander wants to know, once you've created a look for a project, mm -hmm. uh, how do you make sure that that look is maintained throughout, especially, you know, as you start to get, I get, I don't want to say fatigued, but like you've been on this project for a while and you, uh, you don't want to, you know, your eyes get tired basically. Yeah. So, I mean, that just comes through repetition, right? You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of, if you, I don't know, if you just start running, when you first start running, maybe you can't even run a mile, but if you run for years all the time, you can run 20 miles. Right. Hmm. So um, keeping color on a feature consistent whether you're doing it with stills or you just do it instinctually. I mean, that just comes with experience, right? When I was a long, long time ago, when I was, before I even got into features, there was a master in colors. And I remember her telling me, some people cannot hold color throughout the whole feature. They start drifting as time goes on for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And other people can hold color all throughout, you know, long projects, an hour, two hour long projects able to do it and she was always like i, I kind of don't know why that is like you would think if people had stills to refer back to they could easily do it plus if you had a color correction that you started with that let's say had 30 percent desaturation you can just kind of keep that throughout the whole movie you know mm -hmm. um but i mean i i have found that at through time that um the, just kind of like the more you do things the more features that i've gone through that just the easier it's been you know, to the point where I could just go through a whole movie. I don't have to refer back to stills that much. And, you know, from real one to real eight, I don't have to refer <laughs> back. I just, you know, you just kind of learn and you develop a feel and you can even jump through projects or different shows throughout the day. So one could be saturated, 
one, another project could be desaturated. One could be running cold. Another could be running warm. And, you know, after a while, you just build a muscle for your brain and your eyes so that you can just do multiple things at the same time during the same day. You'll be fine. How do you take care of your eyes then to make sure, you know? Uh, I'll tell you a good, a, a good trick to take care of your eyes. Uh, <laughs> it's called listening to books. When <laughs> right? So, so um, this eye doctor that I know basically <laughs> said, everyone that he has had as a patient when they were kids, through high school and they had perfect 2020 vision. The moment they went to college and they studied basically two fields, finance and law, yeah. where they were constantly reading. He was like, by the time they're in their mid to late twenties, they all needed glasses, wow. right? So if I'm staring at a monitor all day long, that's two or three feet away from me, every 15, 20 minutes, I'm staring at something else. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking far, right? So you have to build your, your, your muscles for your eyes to look far and then look close and look far and look close. So the great thing about doing features is I have to stare at a screen that's really far away from me. Mm -hmm. And then I want to take a break. Let me go check my email. And I have my phone in front of my face, which is two feet away from me. Then I go back and my eyes are just back looking really far. When I'm doing actually TV work, it's harder. I feel like my eyes get much more strained, like my far distance gets more strained. So if I'm not working on a feature for a while, I'm only doing stuff to a monitor. I really have to like go home and start looking at things far away, you know? So that's how I take care of my eyes. And if one eye starts getting a little bit blurry, I'll close up the strong eye and just start looking at things with a weak eye. Yeah. Just to get that muscle going. I mean, you know, it's a really great question because um, taking care of your eyes when you're in this kind of field is very, very critical. Yeah, and just like any other muscle in your body, you really have to work it and you really have to take care of it. Right. And yeah. so I have found and I love reading, you know, I found myself reading more now than I ever have. But I, I don't read for a long time and I make sure I have a lot of light so I don't have eye strain mm -hmm. uh, I never read at night. I just read like with a ton of light on it and I'll read only for short periods of time. And if I really got to get through a book. It's audible, man, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the poll quote from this will be, uh, Stefan says, don't read. <laughs> <laughs> read, but listen. Read, but yeah, listen. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I do have, I, someone put in a question, uh, how many trailers do you tend to color correct uh, when you started versus, like when you first started in your career versus now? Oh my God. Well, there was a period in my coloring career where basically I colored trailers full time for, it might've been about two to three years with Sony. I did, we, we had a, a contract with Sony when I was at the Post Group where mm -hmm. we just did all of their trailers. So I color corrected trailers for years. I mean, I must've done like a thousand trailers, wow. right? So um, with all the features that I work on now, I do mostly, I do all the trailers um, for all my features. So um, yeah, and trailers are great. I mean, it's a completely, it's a, it's a little bit of a different way of working, you know, like just because your movie looks a certain way, it doesn't mean your trailer is going to look the same way. I mean, you, you, you're 80% there, yeah. but sometimes they'll jigsaw puzzle things around and you got to make that trailer feel, you know, whatever it's, it's got to feel. And sometimes the color's got to change for that you know so um it's a it's it's i mean i really love trailers it's really fun yeah it's interesting that like you have to sort of diverge from the actual movie's color are you ever worried that people will be like oh what the hell <laughs> it looks so different no no, no. it's it, it, it's not it, it, you don't deviate that far but let's just say you have something that's really desaturated and dark mm -hmm. right you're going to basically do a trailer and that trailer has got to stand on its own for 30 seconds to 60 seconds. It's not like you got a, two hours to get your eyes adjusted to something dark and desaturated, right? Yeah. So you can still keep it desaturated, but if it's going out theatrically in a movie theater, you're gonna cut that trailer next to another trailer. Let's just say I'm doing one trailer for an action movie, for example, yeah. right? So if I'm doing like Born Ultimatum, for example, yeah. and a lot of contrast, I got a lot of cuts, I got a lot of action going on. 
I'm making that trailer bright and contrasty and colorful, right? And if I'm doing another movie that is gonna get, I don't know, cut in, 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 in you know, it's gonna be in that movie theater, that may be another trailer next to it, but inherently is dark and desaturated, that thing is gonna look twice as dark and desaturated if it's coming after the other trailer, right? So I know that's gotta happen. So then I'll kind of like lift it up a little bit, right? You, because you just don't want it to be worse than what it could have been. You know what I mean? Like if it is already dark and desaturated, as long as the stimulus of bright and contrasting color was not next to it, it looks fine. But if you got stuff bumpered around it that's yeah. contrasting and bright and colorful, it's going to feel twice as dark and desaturated. So, you know, you, you, you kind of make a call on that. Now, <laughs> going back to our discussion about books, uh, Peter wants to know, what books would you recommend for colorists? And I want to expand on that. based Because you said you were a big fan of reading, what books would you recommend that you loved? Well, for coloring, I don't know of any coloring book. Um, you know, the best thing to learn how to color is you basically just get, you know, whether you take a class on it or you go somewhere where there's a coloring facility, you know, and you can just start, you can just start practicing your color that way. You learned from um, the mean streets of LA. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So that's the nice part about being in, um, you know, big cities like LA is like, you, you know, there's a lot of places that color. Um, but for books, I mean, there's a great book that everybody should read called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Oh yeah, I've read that. Right? Very good. So if you- It's have, heavy though, I will say. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's heavy, it's heavy, but it's, it's a fantastic book yeah. during this time. Yeah. During this Definitely. pandemic, during this period where like, nobody can sense when we're gonna come out of this. The, there's really no answer right? And everybody's been on lockdown and, you know, people, I mean, people, are, you know, it's a very tough situation right now, but mm -hmm. the book gives you a really good perspective about life yeah. and how to stay positive and how to keep moving forward. And, um, you know, so I, I think, you know, especially when you're in a creative field too, I mean, you really have to have your emotions in a really good place. Yeah right otherwise it shows up in your work too yeah i mean i really feel that like it really shows up in your work so um you just want to be in a really good place everywhere so i mean i would recommend that book if that, yeah. if that's read a the fantastic book, book read that book yeah um now you've been very generous with your time so i want to thank you very much for joining me i do have one last question that i'd like to ask everyone i interview what would you say your favorite guilty pleasure film is to watch Mine? Yeah. My guilty pleasure film to watch. Yeah. I don't know if it's a guilty pleasure. That's fine. Forrest Gump. Sorry? Forrest Gump. Yeah. I usually tell people, you know, you're flipping around on Sunday on the television and it comes up and you're like, and I wouldn't have watched this today, but it's on, so I'll watch it. Right? Oh, one of those things. Yeah. One of those ones. That, that, that's not like considered like a great, yeah, like popular movie. I don't know. Hard to say. I can't, I, I, I really can't think of it. You know, you know what movie I think is, you know what movie back in the day I probably watched like 20 times? What? Is Boiler Room. Oh yeah, that's, you know what? No Do you remember ever... that movie? Yeah. That was a really good movie. Yeah. Yeah. So that movie, I don't know, for, for whatever reason, I think I've watched that movie like 20 times. Whenever, yeah. if it comes on, like, I'll watch it. And it's odd that it's not talked about that much. Because I remember watching it and being like, oh, that's a really good movie. And then no one really talked about it. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So like, maybe, maybe that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview. My pleasure. All right. Have a, uh, enjoy the weekend. All right. You too. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.